everyone. Today we're going to talk about the Shushima Nagara Japanese Natural Whetstone. These are really interesting stones, uh, very usable and usually very attractive to people who are just starting to get into Japanese whetstones. Um, there are some misconceptions about the stone that are floating around and some questions people frequently have about them when they're looking to maybe purchase them or have already done so. Uh, so it is an ideal stone for us to take a look at. We'll do our normal a little bit of background, a little bit about the characteristics, and then a polishing and sharpening test with the stone so you can get an idea of uh, its performance and whether or not you might like to have one. So the first question that usually comes up about the Shushima Nagara is uh, why is it called a Nagara? And I, <clears throat> I intend to cover this question at greater length in a different video which specifically focus um, on these handheld Nagara. But uh, in this case, especially because this is probably the most prevalent Nagara bench stone that people have access to both financially and uh, stock-wise, it's a fairly available, readily available stone. I figure it's also worth covering in this video. <clears throat> so um, when we say the word Nagara, we are saying correcting stone. And that concept can be used in different ways depending on what you are trying to correct. So when we talk about it in the context of these handheld stones, which is one way you will see these Shushima Nagara, uh, you will see them in these little handheld formats as well. This is not a Shushima Nagara, but it's an example of a handheld Nagara. These, when we talk about them, are used to correct the surface of the whetstone. That's what we're referring to when we call them a correcting stone and Nagara stone. Um, they can correct a stone right by uh, generating swarf or, or generating slurry or mud, um, you know, refreshing the surface of the stone so we get new abrasive, helping with cutting performance. We can use it to knock off the sharp edges on the side or work down high spots on the stone itself. So <clears throat> in a handheld format, when we say correcting stone nagara, we're correcting the whetstone. Um, when we have these bench nagara, though, it is in reference to correcting the blade of, of uh, the, the knife or the otherwise instrument that we are sharpening or polishing. Typically, when you hear uh, or when you look at these bench nagara, which they won't be called that, they'll just be called a nagara. This is just a Shushima nagara. Uh, it is referring to it being part of a progression for polishing. It could be about blade... Um, sharpening work, it could be about blade geometry work, but um, typically when we look at the historical precedent for stones that keep that Nagara designation, it's, it's relative to uh, sharpening and polishing of the, uh, the entire blade itself. So um, that is why this is still called a Shushima Nagara. It is capable of being in that progression and uh, it's, it has the characteristics that we would normally look for uh, in a bench stone format for correcting scratches on blades, uh, which really comes down to a certain level of consistency um, you know, between different stones. They perform similar uh, and they are repeatable. <clears throat> on that note, we'll, we'll start talking about this stone more in particular. Um, this is what some people might call a uh, ocean blue or blue Shushima. Um, it has this uh, gray, black, slate color to it. And um, that's where sometimes that blue comes from is that the slurry that comes up can be a, a grayish blue. Um, you know, I think that it usually looks more gray to me, but I can see where people are coming from when it's wet, can have that hue. And uh, the ocean portion of it comes from the fact that uh, these Shushima Nagara stones come from, or came from, the mine is closed, came from an underwater mine. So uh, that's where that variety, um, that portion of the name comes from. There are two varieties of, of uh, Shushima stones. One of them is called a Shushima mountain stone. It is a, it is a brown stone, it usually has holes in the surface. It's much coarser than this, kind of in that range, uh, the, the, the line right between Aratoishi and Nakatoishi. And generally you're, you almost never see them. They're considered relatively poor quality, they don't really have any major collector value, and um, you, don't, you don't really see them pop up. So uh, almost any time you're dealing with a Shushima stone, um, they're talking about this type of stone. In an analogous grit rating, uh, 
depending on stone to stone and how you use it. Usually we will call these between a 4,000 uh, grit or to 6,000 grit stone. It is right at the end of the Nakatoishi grit range and it's setting you up for your, your finishing stones. Um, they are very consistent performers. They're very unlikely to have toxic inclusions. And for their size, uh, they're very price efficient. A stone like this typically can be found for under $200, which uh, obviously if you're coming from a synthetic background, that's very expensive. If you are looking at uh, larger J nats, um, it's, a, it's a fairly affordable stone. And even compared to a synthetic, it's uh, a very efficient stone because they wear much slower, they're much more compressed, and uh, you will probably get more mileage out of this than $200 in synthetic grit stones at that 4,000 to 6,000 grit level. Now, um, usually the concern with natural stone even if you're getting a good deal like that, is that maybe there will be a sand inclusion uh, or a toxic uh, mineral inclusion in the stone itself, which could affect the stone's performance. Or maybe you get different layers that perform a little differently. Uh, one of the really great things about the Tsushima Nagra is that you, you almost never get any of that. It's just a consistent block of one piece of stone. So uh, that is another thing that makes them really attractive to people who are just starting out, is that it's very likely to give them consistent performance all the way through the stone. Some of the disbenefits of the stone uh, are that they can be prone to cracking, uh, especially if you soak them, especially if they are unsealed. So, uh, I mean, many Japanese natural whetstones will be sealed up, um, up you know, either after purchase or maybe before purchase by certain vendors. Uh, however, many of them are not. They'll be sold unsealed. The Shishima Nagra, though, on the other hand, is almost never sold unsealed um, because those the stones have that propensity to crack. Similarly, um, unlike most other stones, you will see that people must always use this rice paper. It can be probably hard to see on video, but usually there's a, a, a rice paper wrap, lacquer, and then they'll do a couple layers of that to try to strengthen the stone. Um, a lot of people who've worked with these in Japan will frequently say you'll never use the whole stone because once it gets thin, you know, it's going to crack on you. Uh, so you won't be able to exhaust it. Um, if it starts getting, you know, thinner like this, um, you're going to probably want to put it on a, on a piece of wood, glue it onto a piece of wood for some extra background, you know, extra back support. Um, but it's still potentially going to crack on you. Of course, you can still use it after that happens. Uh, you've just got to smooth out this, you know, any of the crack areas and make sure that they're not going to interfere with uh, the performance of the polishing or sharpening. Other than that, um, they're really interesting stones. They're also pretty popular among razor users. Um, and that brings us to some of the misconceptions about the stone that's worth covering before we jump into actually using it. Frequently, you will see ocean blue or Tsushima stones that are sold as... Um, 10,000 grit analogous or 12,000 grit analogous stones. Uh, I, there is not a Shushima stone that is in the 10,000 to 12,000 grit range. Uh, they don't really even get into the finishing Awasato step of stones. Um, where that misconception comes from is, especially in harder Shushima stones, uh, their surface will exhaust fairly quickly, so they might mud up at the very beginning, but uh, it will want you to use a diamond plate or a natural nagra to refresh the surface so you keep getting cutting power. Um, when you don't refresh the surface of most whetstones that don't self-slurry, uh, they will start doing what we call burnishing, where it's a pure, purely polishing the edge that you're working on. And uh, these stones will burnish very well, but burnishing is not cutting. And uh, what will happen is if you're working your blade on the edge and you keep going after the stone has exhausted, you will find that it gives you a fairly mirror-like finish on both the cladding and the core steel. And some people will get to that point and go, see, look, it's a 10,000 or a 12,000 grit stone because I got to a mirror finish on, on the cladding uh, and the core steel. And, um, you know, that's the difference between cutting your way to a mirror-ish polish or uh, burnishing your way to a mirror-ish polish. And the, the problem with saying that's a 10,000 to 12,000 grit stone is that it's not actually removing scratches up to that range. So if you uh, used a 8,000 grit stone and then jumped to your Shishima, 
while it was exhausted, so while it was burnishing, you will get a really nice mirror polish on the cladding and the core steel out of it, but you will not find that you're actually erasing those 8,000 grit scratches because you're not removing metal through grinding power. Uh, you're really just using the binder that's very soft in here to brighten up uh, the very surface level of the metal. So when you say something's a 10,000 to 12,000 grit, um, it means it has to cut the metal at that level, and these will not do that. So, especially in the razor community, um, you'll see, you know, vendors who uh, maybe aren't selling it as honestly, or, or Amazon vendors who are selling it that will say it's that level, and, and it's not. It's just not going to actually cut the metal or grind the metal at the 10,000, 12,000 grit range, not even at the 8,000 grit. It's going to cap out typically around that that 6,000 grit range. So that doesn't mean the stone doesn't have a use, but it is important that you know you don't go into it having one expectation as to what the stone might do for you, and then you know you find out um, that it's not going to be able to perform at that level. So typically, you know, this would be a decent stone between um, your starter synthetic and your finishing stone if you're sharpening. Um, I typically like something that's a little bit more aggressive than these stones. Uh, for that middle step, um, you know, I really, I like an Izu is a little bit more aggressive than this, and I think that it gets the job done a little faster. Um, however, these stones are pretty good if you wanted to have multiple steps. If you wanted to go a, a 1000 grit synthetic to um, a Binswe or an Ikarashi, and then to an Izu, and then to a Shushima, and then finish on a Awasato stone. Um, you could do that and it would, you know, line you up really well. At that point you're starting to follow a polishing-like progression for sharpening. Um, you could also work up to a 2000 grit synthetic stone and then probably jump to this with a reasonable amount of success. Um, if you're using your kitchen knife for tasks that are more utility based, so you're not cutting raw protein, you're not making really precise cuts where um, have, you know, a, a very keen edge is important either for visual purposes or, or how you're manipulating your blade. Um, these could finish, you know, a Nikiri or, or um, a, a Petty or something like that with uh, very acceptable performance. Um, you know, something that you don't need to have that screaming uh, sharp edge on. The last thing to cover is that these stones can be mistaken for other stones, and obviously the flip around too. Um, there is a stone called a Bushu uh, stone. They're very rare, but they they um, inhabit the same relative 4,000 to 6,000 Nakatoishi range as the Shushima stone. They're typically a little darker. They'll have um, a similar look, but they'll have patterns in here that are black and gray. And uh, frequently on the sides, they will have um, some form of what we call stone skin, um, you know, a, a uh, where it looks more like regular stone rather than the inner stone here, you know, it'll be rough. Um, the truth is that you're probably not going to accidentally get that stone in place of this one because uh, it has a kind of a collector's value to it and they, they tend to go for higher and there's not many floating around. Uh, another stone that you might find, uh, if you're hunting for a Shushima stone, and you're buying unknown stones, one you may accidentally get in place of this is a, an Otanayama stone, Otanayami stone. Um, and uh, they look very similar. They're usually a little darker than this. And the difference between the two is that the Otanayama stones are very hard and they may actually get up into that higher grit range. Um, they're definitely an Awasato and they can be difficult, you know, more difficult to work with because they are that much harder, much finer grip. Um, but visually they can kind of look similar, so uh, if you're bidding on a stone, you don't know what it is, um, the truth is it's far more likely to be a Shushima because these stones are uh, much more prevalent and much more available. Taniyama stones are not as common um, and not sought after, so there's just not as many floating around. But in theory, if you buy an unknown stone you think is a Shushima and you find it's a little darker, a little bit more black than this, much harder, much finer, it's probably not an exceptional version of a Shushima stone. It's probably an Otaniyama stone um, that was either mislabeled or, you know, originally the stone was misidentified as a Shushima stone. So anyway, let's go ahead and take a look at our stone here. 
And we'll start off as normal with a polishing test. So they don't tend to be super thirsty stones. Um, they'll suck up a little bit of water, um, but you also find, you know, that they get that out of the way very quickly, and then the water will just pool on the surface here. Um, similar to most Nakatoishi, you can choose to either use a higher grit diamond plate, if you're using diamond plates, a lower grit diamond plate, it will respond well to both. Um, a, a 140 grit diamond plate will definitely scratch the surface up pretty good, but that doesn't really matter, it's uh, just visual, it will still work for you. Um, this will make it perform a little bit coarser and a little bit muddier if you use the uh, 140 or a 400, versus if we use a 600 grit diamond plate or this 1200, it'll... Um, be a little bit less muddy and a little bit more controllable because we're not uh, really, you know, um, digging up the surface of the stone. Uh, you can also use an actual uh, Shushima handheld Nagara. In that case, uh, they're functionally a Tomo Nagara because Shushima stones tend to be so similar and consistent stone to stone uh, in their performance. And that will that might be the most common way to do it out of all the stones. They are the easiest to find kind of that Tomo Nagara for, um, and the, those smaller ones tend to be pretty cheap, um, 20, 30 bucks or something. So, uh, I actually have one, I just failed to bring it out. So we're still going to use the diamond plate, but, uh, the, this is a great candidate, um, for having a real Tomo Nagara for it, where it's a matching companion Nagara. And, uh, especially as a starting stone, you know, if you're getting a fairly versatile, uh, not super fine, so it's a more workable stone, as your first JNAT, um, you know, this will always give you good performance. You can get that cool Tomo Nagara with it, which will generate that pure slurry, and uh, they're very available. It's one of the things that kind of makes this package attractive, uh, I think, to people who are just starting out. And um, I think the frequent user of a Shushima Nagara will get one at the beginning of their JNAT experience. Um, find that it's kind of between a lot of different stones that they have. As they explore, it might go to the back of their collection for a while. Uh, and you might find, okay, it's kind of overlapping with these other stones. Do I even really want to keep it? But over time, uh, there's a good chance you will start pulling it back out again and using it uh, because there is just a uh, no nonsense usability to it that maybe some of the other stones, while they have fun characteristics, they're prettier, uh, and maybe they're more interesting case by case. Um, if you really just want to get the job done, um, these are easy to use and they are, uh, there's not a lot to go wrong with them. So anyway, let's go ahead and generate some slurry. I am using the 1200 and you can see that the stone is not a hard stone. Uh, it will generate, uh, this, uh, slurry very quickly with very little pressure and uh, let's go ahead and take a look here. So let's use this side today. I'll go ahead and uh, try to get a visual here as to what it looks like currently for you. And it's just cleaned up a little bit from the last time that we did this. All right. So one of maybe the drawbacks of these uh, Shushima stones is that it can be a little bit hard to see the, um, what we call swarf, the actual metal particles within the slurry. So there, there's actually already some in here. In person, it's a little easier to see. This is, this is lighter, this is darker, um, but uh, you know, unlike other stones where if they have that higher contrast, you'll be able to see the metal grindings. Uh, these can be very difficult to see the metal grindings in. And because they're softer, they're more likely to pull up additional slurry, which means you don't get that super heavy uh, level of metal concentration floating around in the, um, in the slurry. But you can still tell if you're paying close attention. And at the end of the day, the stone is, is probably medium typically their medium cutting speed, so you don't really have to worry about whether or not uh, you're getting it. You'll, you'll feel it on your blade edge, whether it's continuing to cut or if it's uh, burnishing, it won't feel um, as abrasive, it'll feel more slick and your blade might start catching.
So these stones really are very nice to use. They're very slick. Um, they have a lot of really great properties to them that are frequent amongst bench nagara, but many other bench nagara are super thirsty. These aren't as thirsty, so it's a lot easier to work this mud on the surface, and uh, they really are a joy to use, so long as you have reasonable expectations for what they're going to give you. Let's see what we're dealing with here. Let's do another pass or two. It's not going to be perfect. We're not spending probably enough time, not paying enough attention to make it perfect, but uh, it's good to get a reasonably close expectation here. So if you watched the Aizu video, you'll find that they perform kind of similar. This is that little step up. Uh, do you need to use a step like this after Aizu before, um, you know, a three out of five Awasedo? No, you don't. Um, you could go Aizu and, and next step, or you could replace your Aizu with, with a Shushima. It's just going to take you a while longer to delete the scratches of the previous stone, uh, but it is viable. So uh, here's the finish that we are left with. As always, this is a little difficult. We'll try to get a little closer here. I'll we'll also give the um, autofocus a try. All right, hopefully that gives you a good idea as to how it worked out for us. They're fairly fast, we didn't spend too much time on it. Um, you get a pretty heavy um, but very consistent scratch pattern on your cladding. Uh, you have a very faint scratch pattern on your core steel. Compared to the Aizu, uh, it has a similar scratch pattern um, with less scratches on the core steel. I would say still a, a tad less present scratches on the cladding, but very similar. Um, so it is really just that step up. Uh, it could be it could be useful if you have um, really hard core steel. Um, to have that little jump between something like an Aizu and your Awasedo, uh, so that you're working that harder metal scratches down in smaller steps. But uh, this is like a 62 HRC, and I wouldn't think that's necessary, maybe something 64, 65. Um, that step could aid you in how much time you have to spend and how much stone you have to spend on getting the scratches out at the beginning of the Awasedo step. So okay, um, it's a, it was easy to use. Um, it mudded up real well. And these do self slurry to a certain degree. Um, they can exhaust as we covered. So with some more use, uh, you know, eventually they do stop self slurrying, but uh, they're pretty good about it. And there are different, Shushimas do perform different stone to stone. Some are harder, some are softer, but they're within a variance range that is actually not nearly as broad as other stones. Like a harder Shushima has still a lot in common with a softer Shushima than almost any other stone. Um, 
their their range is is just smaller uh, which makes them good you know if you're really more of a utilitarian and you're just looking for that consistent performance uh nagara uh bench stones are kind of lauded as very consistent um that's one of the things you pay for but unlike other nagara bench stones uh these are not super expensive uh a lot of those other nagara bench stones you pay a lot of money for um so again from a utilitarian standpoint this can be a really fantastic stone so uh, we'll go ahead and sharpen on it. I will generate a little bit of slurry. Usually I do this so you, uh, you can see the cutting performance. In this case, due to the darkness of the stone, it might be hard for you to see the removal of the metal, but we'll give it a try anyway. Hopefully you can see it is visible in person. Um, most Tsushima are, are not slow stones. Um, it's of course still below your synthetics, but uh, it's they're efficient. They get the job done. All right, and as always, um, you guys will see me use the blade for polishing. You'll see me use it for sharpening here. Things move pretty fast uh, because the blade is already in almost done condition, right? Um, I'm not actually trying to remove scratches from a previous step, and the knife is already super, was already in an extremely thin um, apex. So forming a burr and then knocking it off takes me very little time. It is important that when you think of it, you using it, um, it can take a lot longer to produce these results if you are not past the stone, right? Like I, I'm, I'm, my edge is past the Tsushima step and the polish was past the Tsushima step. So when we polish or when we sharpen, we go back to that step, which means that the work is done very quickly. If I was coming from a full Aizu redo and a full blade bevel reset um, to form that burr and then to subsequently knock it off or to polish it so that all the previous scratches are gone could take us a bit longer. Um, maybe a literal five to, to seven minutes on the stone for sharpening could be 30 minutes depending on the stone jump you're making for polishing. Um, so just keep that in mind. I, I don't think I've covered that in previous videos, but it is it is something that's worth considering uh, so you don't have false expectations. You're not going to necessarily get the stone and get the same polish that you see here in, I don't know, maybe we spend three minutes on the stone. You're going to usually spend a little bit more time on it. But at the end of the day, we're just looking at what it can give you, uh, not necessarily the whole process. And uh, maybe a future video, I'll do, you know, a whole progression uh, and you guys can see how long it takes uh, for me to get through some of the steps. So as you can see, the stone did eventually need some more water, but um, not a whole lot. They really have kind of that nice, um, that nice in between where they're a little thirsty They'll suck up a little bit of water so when you work them, uh, you don't find a dry surface underneath. You find some water retention, but they're not so thirsty that you're just getting frustrated that the stone is drying out on you. Oh, we're feeling pretty good there. And um, I didn't, I guess I won't first evaluate it this way, but let's go ahead and take a look at it. Obviously you guys can't really feel it beyond visually looking, but uh, it's definitely a keen edge. Um, 
it feels nice. It feels, I mean, it still definitely has a little bit of teeth in the manner in which we sharpened it, but it's an extremely usable edge. Uh, and if you weren't, again, going for that really super keen uh, um, apex, this would be an extremely usable blade. You know, I would uh, be able to cook or uh, do general prep work with this with no frustration. Um, easily move through, you know, your typical harder to cut uh, carrots, tomatoes, that type of stuff. So we didn't do it on the Izu, and the Izu can benefit from this as well. But the Tsushima, um, we can do a, kind of some water only passes here with a little bit lighter pressure. And the personality of the stone will allow us to get a little bit of a, of a finer edge on the edge. Uh, on it. Um, this doesn't work as much for polishing because again either the stone is exhausted and you're just burnishing or the stone is not exhausted and the amount of pressure and surface area you're applying will kick up that slurry. Um, and you can see we actually already have uh, it's, it is self slurrying to a degree here um, but if we go real light use a lot of water we can kind of bump that edge up and if I was going to stop on the stone um, for a knife only sharpening job, I, I would probably do this. I'd probably run this step and just keep it, again, real light. Uh, we're not honing, obviously, it, but we're kind of trying to do a, a mixed mimic job where we get the lightest abrasion we can while just trying to be more equal on either side and maybe switch more often. Yeah, and that definitely kicks it up to the next level. It's not an Awasato edge. You know, it's not that 8,000 grit edge, but it could probably compete with the very soft, very coarse Awasato, like something like a three out of five. Doing what we just did there at the end uh, could compete, I think edge-wise, I think that feels pretty similar to my, to my finger. Um, yeah. So these are really good stones. Hopefully that's become evident. Uh, they're very usable. You can buy them for sharpening and maybe branch out into polishing later. They are a stone that you could polish on and then use a, you know, a finger stone afterwards and get a really good polish out of it. You just have to spend a little bit of time deleting those scratches, but the scratches are fine enough and shallow enough for that to be within range of, of doing. So uh, I think they're really great stones for entry level into JNATs, so long as you're not shopping specifically for a super high grit finisher. If you're shoot shooting for that super high grit finisher, um, for razors or for high hardness knives, knives or uh, sashimi, you know, raw protein knives, I would look elsewhere. Um, I don't think these will, f these will not fit that need. Um, but if you're more interested in an all arounder, uh, you are a knife guy, uh, a knife or tool guy, uh, or you are kind of want to mess around with some polishing, um, but you don't want it to be that final step. The softness of this and the quality of the, the consistency and the grit and the different characteristics it has, I think really makes it uh, an ideal candidate. So uh, hopefully this was helpful to you. If you have any questions, uh, leave them in the comment below. I guess like and subscribe, so on and so forth. And uh, until next time.